so far so we have uh, yet another day with about uh, six speakers and at the end of the day we're going to have a panel discussion that's going to be very interesting so let's start uh, today now with uh, Zico Kalter who's going to talk about the quality robotics speaks about randomized thanks very much so it's great to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming to the early slot in the morning. I know it's, a, it's an effort to a certain extent, so thanks for coming here. Um, this is, I guess, the first session on adversarial, adversarial robustness, or the first talk on this day of adversarial robustness and robustness talk. Um, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction, because that's the role of the first person, I think, on the day. But then I'll talk largely about um, some recent work we've been doing on provable robustness via a technique called randomized smoothing. Um, we have a lot of sort of work kind of broadly in this area. I'll touch on some of that, including some older work by Eric Wong. But the majority of this talk is going to focus on some work by Jeremy and Ilan uh, on, on using these randomized methods and smoothing methods to get guarantees about robustness of classifiers. OK, so, so since this, this is the first talk of the day on robustness, I, I, it is my uh, maybe unfortunate duty to have to actually walk through the slides that you've all seen before on, on robustness, or hopefully many of you have seen before on robustness. And of course, the big question of this is do you start with uh, Ian's picture of the panda or with Alex's picture of the, of the uh, pig? And, and uh, you know, given that Alex was, in fact, the organizer's event, you know, I, I certainly went, you know, honored him and, and used the, the, the <laughs> used the flying pig as our example. So. The, the, the idea here is, as I'm sure many of you know, deep classifiers, as Jason had in his you know, brief interaction yesterday, are solving the whole world's problems, but they have this big issue. And the big issue, well, A, many big issues, but one big issue, is that you can take classifiers that seem to work perfectly well, you add a little tiny bit of imperceptible noise, carefully chosen, and you can basically make them predict anything you want them to predict. They can be arbitrarily fooled. Um, and the idea, of course, is very simple here, and these things are all differentiable, so just like you can differentiate to maximize parameters, you can also differentiate the inputs of these things um, to find to basically maximize the loss or maximize a targeted loss, maybe that you know try to classify something else. Um, and this idea has received a lot of prominence in recent years. Uh, I think the recent surge of interest is largely due to some work um, out of Google and, and others. Um, but to be clear, this this sort of idea of robustness of classifiers goes back well, well beyond this. Specifically in the context of adversarial ML, it goes back at least 15 years. Um, but of course, even more so, this is related to issues of just SVMs and margins, as well as robust optimization. So I, so I really don't want to even you know, quantify when this started. But I will say that in 2012, 2015, it was sort of appreciated that these problems were very, very prevalent, specifically for deep networks. And I think they are actually quite, the issues do become more pronounced in deep networks. And so because of that, these issues have received a lot more attention this issue of robustness here. Now, before I jump into kind of what we can do about this, I do want to try to at least answer a little bit of this question, which I get a lot, about why should we care about this, right? This is, I think this is a totally fair question. Because if you look at this example, I mean, this is a, oops, let me just go back here. This is a uh, you know, very carefully crafted noise here that was specifically chosen to maximize the loss, knowing the model's gradients, all those kind of things. Um, and in that case, you know, is this really indicative of something we're ever going to encounter in the world? Well, probably not. Um, and so you know, if you actually have an adversary controlling the pixel inputs to your system and able to manipulate them you know, in, a, in a bitwise fashion, you probably have bigger problems than, than you know, misclassifying your, uh, a pig as an airplane. Um, but there are, I think there are, and I think there are, despite this fact, there are really a lot of very good reasons to still care about this very much. So, and, and there are really two that I typically highlight here when I, when I, when I think about motivating this, this area of research. Um, the first one is there really are, I believe, and I think probably Nicholas will, will touch on this a little bit more as well, or maybe he will. Um, there really are genuine security implications for these things. So we are starting to trust, to entrust AI systems to make predictions that have real consequences. And when you do this, you want some notion of, of, of you know, <laughs> some hope that they will work beyond just the exact data that they were trained upon. Um, and if they're in high critical, you know, in, in, in sort of um, mission critical scenarios like self-driving cars or health decisions, uh, the fact that attackers can actually fool these things does seem to be problematic. Uh, and this is not just, I mean, though those examples I'm showing there are kind of these digital artifacts. 
These are not just digital uh, phenomena. So people have shown you can basically do the same thing in the real world. So here's a colleague of mine at CNU putting on glasses uh, with a little fu funny pattern on them to make a face detection system think he is this person uh, who he is not. Um, some work out of Berkeley, uh, I don't know if any of them are here, but some, some work out of, of Don Song's group showed that you can put stickers on stop signs to make uh, classifiers classify these as speed limit signs instead. Um, some work out of, uh, out of MIT, they 3D printed a turtle that was supposed to look like a rifle from any angle. So this, this pattern of markings in the turtle makes it think it's a rifle. And this is kind of hard to see here, but we did some work recently showing you can actually pl place a patch kind of anywhere in the image to suppress all object detection that happens anywhere else in that image. So not just, not just the, you know, overlapping what you've sort of changed, but anywhere else in the image, this computer, this cups and stuff are normally detected, but with this patch here, they all, they all vanish. Um, and I think, you know, as we think about deploying ML to security critical scenarios, we need to understand uh, the risks involved, just like we need to understand computer security risks when we deploy, you know, large scale sc uh, computer security problems. And so I think this is not something to, to ignore here. There really are security implications here. Um, but in addition, and I think probably as, as Alex will, will highlight uh, even more, I also think this says something very fundamental about the nature of our classifiers. Um, so the fact that these things exist tells us something, I think, fundamental about what these classifiers are learning, the fact that they seem to be learning things that are very different from the representations that we think about using when we want to classify objects, about the smoothness of the decision boundaries that, they're, that, 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 that are being implied here, and about sensitivity as uh, you know, related to what Ben was talking about yesterday, of things like sensitivity to distribution shift. So in some sense, the adversarial setting is you know, capturing the worst case distribution shift within that allowable threat model, right? So within the threat model of basically um, allowing perturbations over some, over some region delta. Um, OK, so that's adversarial attacks on networks. And now I want to talk about adversarial robustness to, net, to, to, to these attacks. So, if we want to actually make a system that will not classify this as an airliner, but in fact classify it as a pig, what do we do? Um, and the basic idea here is actually quite simple. Uh, or what, what, well, what we should do is quite simple. Um, you can do other things which you shouldn't do, which, which uh, maybe Nicholas will also talk about. Um, <laughs> but what you do is you just rethink your normal loss function. So normally we, we put our parameters in our network to minimize the expected value of losses uh, of our network you know, un under those parameters. And since now what we're concerned about is not just this sort of you know, nominal loss. Oops, I actually added a delta there. I should not be the delta there. Um, I guess I'm not doing anything with that. So delta equals zero in that case. But uh, what we're switching to, as you might, as this sort of alludes to, is this other setting where now, because we cared about the setting where you maximize over some perturbation that you add to your image, we actually now want to just, in, this, you know, in, in the most natural setting, we want to instead find network parameters that for the worst case perturbation, still minimize this sort of worst case loss. And this is classical robust optimization, to be clear. Um, but applying it in this ML, especially in the deep learning context, is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit interesting. So this is the optimization problem associated with adversarial robustness. And there really are two ways, I think, you can go about doing this. There is a third way, which is you just try to do something that might work in some cases. But when you do that, then again, Nicholas writes a paper a few, a few weeks later talking about how your thing doesn't work. So if you want this to actually work, you should really do one of two things. Um, the first thing you can do is uh, goes by the name of adversarial training. It's very simple. Um, we're going to take normal SGD steps in our models. We're going to use normal SGD in our model. But we're not going to take steps. Yeah, question. So what confuses me about the definition is that the y is the same uh, as the label on x. So uh, yeah, why is the actual label of yeah. our example x? Yes. Yeah, so like if you perturb by delta yep. and uh, your label changes, but that's also the correct label. Yeah, OK, okay that's a good point. So, so if you make such a big perturbation, this actually becomes an airplane instead of a, 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 a yeah. So the key element here is this perturbation region delta. And really, in all the work we do, we are assuming perturbation regions delta that are small enough such that we assume that any perturbation in this region should not change the label. Now, coming up with that perturbation region 
is a whole nother issue, which I'm not going to touch on. We, you know, we typically, uh, so, so, so really what you want there is you want like semantic similarity, something really confusing and hard, right? Which you can't get at. Um, so what we do instead is we use really simple heuristics like L infinity bounds, like really simple things that we know with a small enough degree we can't even see these things. So we should definitely be the same level. So this, in the normal case, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for true robustness. But the fact is that we can't even do this yet, I think, speaks to a very important aspect of our current uh, systems. Yeah. But perhaps a minor modification of the question is if this was a regression setting. Yeah the y will change, yeah. and perhaps what you want is that it changes in a small amount as well. So really, this is a notion of continuity. Yeah, exactly. So, so essentially, this, this is absolutely a Lipschitz notion. So this is a notion about the Lipschitz constant of the underlying classifier. Um, and so yes, in a regression setting, which you, like, you, you can formulate these things all the same way, where as, you know, essentially it's a Lipschitz constant. You want to ensure that a certain change in your input does not change your output but very much. Yeah. Local these are all about smoothness which is why we, you know, we're using smoothing to solve these things. OK, so, so adversarial training uh, is this simple thing where you just basically take SG steps, but you don't take them at the, at the normal, not the nominal points. You first kind of solve this problem, and then take an SG step at the worst case solution there. Now, of course, it's hard to solve this problem. Right? This, this is a non-convex problem, um, and we can't do that necessarily a great job of solving it, but that's never really bothered us before in deep learning, the fact that we can't solve problems. So what we do is we just try to solve this approximately, say via PGD or via some, any sort of attack you can come up with. I mean, the inner problem is just finding you know, the attack vector. Um, and you take uh, steps at the worst case example. Um, and by uh, actually, uh, you know, sim simple, th well, Danskin's theorem, this sort of says that this is actually, you know, the, the, the gradient at the worst case thing is actually the gradient of this max objective. Or pretty, under pretty general conditions. So that's sort of the first thing you can do. Um, the challenge there, though, and, and, and by the way, that does, that does work to a certain extent. And, and this is, is the basis for the best empirical defenses that we know how to construct. Um, but if we want to go beyond just sort of saying something that works in practice, if we want to actually have guarantees about the, the you know, are the things definitely secure in this entire region, not just the best we can do with some non convex solver, we need some other way. And so this leads to what, I, what we call provable or certified defenses. There was a question about, is there a difference between those terms? No, there's not. I use them interchangeably. Um, and so a certified defense will actually do something like form an actual upper bound on this quantity here. And if we can upper bound this quantity and show that you know, the worst case loss in this upper bound, this quantity, never say you know, becomes, uh, for error, never becomes more than one. Then we've actually, uh, or, or you know, if you just look, look at the function itself, the function never becomes positive, say. Um, then, uh, then we can actually guarantee here that this would actually be not, not, not just robust, but certifiably robust to any sort of perturbation, again, within our set. So if we can, again, if we can compute this upper bound here, an upper bound on this inner quantity, we can actually get guarantees about the robustness of classifiers. Uh, and these are the two things you really should do. One of these two is what you should do if you want to develop a classifier that is robust against adversarial attacks. So just to give a quick sense, and, and, and so you know, a lot of our initial work uh, sort of looked at exactly at this kind of method of upper bounding this inner problem. And to see how we do that, it's actually quite, I can sort of I'm going to describe it in, in one slide or and then uh, maybe two slides, um, but focus actually mainly on another approach in this talk. Uh, and the basic idea is um, we take our problem, so we want to maximize our, our function over delta. We're going to assume, uh, we're going to assume here that the uh, network is going to be a feedforward network with nothing but ReLUs as our nonlinearity. We can actually construct other uh, things as well, but that's sort of a simple case. And we started out with just a ReLU case. So what you can do if you have ReLUs is the, the only nonlinearity, the only reason why this problem is hard to solve is because of the values, right? Those are the only nonlinearity. Everything else is linear in the network. So what we do is we relax the values to the convex hull of their values, assuming some lower and upper bounds, which themselves are hard to get, but we get them kind of in an iterative fashion. But if you have some lower and upper bound, you can relax the ReLU to be a, a convex hull of the ReLU. And what's cool now is that this maximization problem now becomes actually a linear program. Because our nonlinearities have been relaxed to these linear regions, 
um, and our other, all the other terms in the network are linear. So we get a nice sort of linear program that does this. Um, that's still sort of hard to solve, so we, don't, we still don't really want to solve that. So what we showed in some of our work is you can actually very efficiently create um, a dual of this problem and find a feasible dual solution very efficiently, basically using a single back prop pass, which is not at all obvious how you do that, but we can do that. Um, so you, you can construct a dual relaxation of this, of this, a further relaxation of this LP, um, which actually corresponds to relaxing this, this uh, thing a little bit further into this uh, um, polytope there. And this is actually corresponds exactly to a dual of this LP, though you can also independently derive this with things like hybrid zonotopes, as a group of ETH did, or with forward Lipschitz constants, um, as others did. So this is essentially how these bounds work. By optimizing over these things, you actually can get a provable bound, which is easy to compute, relatively so, on, uh, on, on this thing. And um, that's nice. And I think when, I, when we first started doing this, we were really excited because this is you know, the first time we could get actual provable bounds on these things. And we could you know, certify MNIST to 2% certified error. Uh, we could you know, start, working on, start getting results on CIFAR. And um, unfortunately, it seemed to kind of break down. Yeah, so, so, so a question. So how, how does the quality of the relaxation scale with the depth of the network? Yeah, so those are good questions. So depth scales badly, width scales OK. Um, but the reality is the quality of how tight this outer bound ends up being is really dependent on how you train the network. So if you train the network to minimize the upper bound, as we do, so we actually end up training the network right, to minimize the upper bound, then the bound by that procedure becomes fairly tight. Um, whereas if you just take a normal network, normally trained, and evaluate the bound, it's always vacuous. So, so, but when you train the network, even for relatively deep networks, it can, be, it can become relatively tight. Now, the problem, though, um, there's, there's two problems. And, and the problem is that um, these bounds ultimately, however, are just too loose. That's the, that's the real problem here. Um, even when you train on them for large networks, for large enough networks that you really want to use for bigger problems, like even like CIFAR, um, certainly, but CIFAR is certainly ImageNet. There's, there's two problems. They're just too loose. Um, in other words, minimizing them over-regularizes the network to a point where it isn't very good anymore. Um, and secondly, they don't very scalable. So even with all these tricks of duality and everything, they still get, still take, uh, you know, a, a, a large multiple of the time it takes to train a normal network, and it just doesn't seem like they're they're really going to scale to the size of ImageNet uh, data sets that we want to scale to. And I guess what makes them loose to a certain extent is that at all at the heart of all of them, they're still about kind of propagating a kind of interval bound. So you know you have to bound the upper and lower regions of this ReLU. If those become loose and they become looser and looser as you go deeper in the network, your balance can just get very loose because you have you actually just have too much sort of slack. Uh, that, you're, that you allow in these over in, in these relaxations. So, and, and actually, um, you know, uh, uh, Hadi and, and Jerry too had a paper recently on uh, on just sort of the fact that all of these previous approaches, though there have been a lot of them, there have been a lot of papers on these things. They're basically all doing the exact same thing, um, and they all have this fundamental barrier that comes down to this sort of interval bounds that, that they suffer from. Yeah. So, what is the main contributing factor to the looseness of the bounds? Mm -hmm. is it Convex relaxation? Is it the bound? It's the convex relaxation. It's this part here. Just this, this, <laughs> this, uh, you know, slop you have here. So that's just that's just too much for big. Because you imagine as these as these upper and lower bounds get bigger, yeah. right? Uh, then this becomes a very big region. You can cheat a lot in sort of manipulating your your activations, and that and that's just too loose. And what about duality? Um, that one is not doesn't seem to be as bad. It is bad, but uh, Hadi's work actually evaluated the exact LP. And even with the exact LP, you can't do, you can't, these things just, they don't work that much better. Especially if you train them in the dual, they work kind of the same way. Uh, so it's like that there isn't very much looseness in the bound. Yeah. How do those bounds depend on the width of the network? So, so again, this is all sort of empirical. This isn't, this isn't sort of the theory. But empirically, they, they don't depend very much on the width. Because adding width, it adds more units, but each, the upper and lower bounds, you know, only start expanding a lot when you add depth to the network, when these things combine. So just adding width doesn't seem to affect it that much. So actually, the better networks here that we have are wider but shallower networks for these things. Um, so it doesn't appear to depend on width too much. Yeah. Did you empirically try leaking? Leaky yeah, we tried all, I mean, yes, we can try all the different, all the different activations. Tan H, so those don't, you know, those saturate, uh, uh, sigma, I mean, everything. Doesn't, doesn't, there's no quick fix to these things, yeah. 
come out with more and more adversarial attacks over time. Yes. Is there a system and a magic way of giving guarantees? Well, yeah, there's, these are guarantees, right? So this, this, this is an actual upper boundless quantity saying no matter what you do, if you are an attack within this region, you are safe. It is a guarantee. It's saying that because it's, it's an, a strict upper, a strict upper bound in this quantity, no attack within a certain perturbation region you're, you're defending against could ever, ever do it, no matter how many papers uh, Nicholas and others published. So, you know, so the first paper I was confident enough to, to publish in this area because I knew, uh, assuming our math was right, which I was pretty sure about, uh, we, couldn't, we, we wouldn't be broken two months later. Yeah? So yesterday we had a talk about uh, the fact that uh, at least for uh, linear networks with ReLU, you eventually just get an affine map, and you need to divide the space into regions. So in yeah. that case, the perturbations that matter only if, if you change the region. Yeah, so, so that, this actually will be, so if you have a case like this where, you're, where your perturbation um, keeps you in a certain region, you get exact bounds for free because you'll have both the upper and lower things be on the same side here. And so you're sort of, you sort of get an exact bound. So the bound is exact in that case if you stay within a linear region. This allows you to get provable bounds when you, when you cross linear regions despite that fact that you're crossing them. And so that's what's sort of nice here. But what I was thinking is inside the region, nothing happens. Yeah. You change region, all what matters is the difference of the affine maps. And because there is finitely many, even though it's a combinatorial number, why couldn't you just compute them all? Well, yeah, it's a combinatorial number. That's why you can't do it. So th I mean, th to be clear, like, this is an integer program. Solving this problem exactly is an integer program. But we're talking an integer program with the number of variables equal to the number of hidden units in the network. Uh, this, is never, this, is not, this is not a matter of you know, a few more years. This is a matter of, of the universe dying before it happens. right? Like, uh, this, is, this is not going to be scalable IPs at that level. I don't think, unless, unless you specify the network to make the IP better to solve, which is actually Alex has some, actually not. Yeah, Alex has a student working on that as well. Um, maybe one more question, because this is not what this talk is about. <laughs> and I'll move on. Yeah. Just a quick comment. The combinatorial quantities are exponential in dimension and depth. So, so, you know. Yeah, but in the end, you're only going to move to nearby. So you can just constrain. The, the number you can move to within a perturbation region of reasonable size is already Way, way bigger than anything you would ever be able to solve in practice. The, the, the IP solvers do all that in the right branch and bound way. They already do all that, the, the nice cutting, the, like the nice cutting planes and the nice branch and bound stuff. They're already factoring that in, and you, you really can't do it. There's a huge number of these regions that you have to, you have to certify over. Uh, I think I might move on from this, because this is, again, not the topic of this talk. <laughs> or I thought it wasn't going to be the topic of this talk. Maybe it was. OK. so so. Let me talk about what this talk is about now. <laughs> what this talk is about is about a kind of different approach to this. Because we, we really feel like we've hit a limit, or I think we've hit a limit, is with current approaches that are just based on these duality bounds. Um, and what I want to talk, what I want to talk about said is a different approach based upon really much simpler methods in a lot of ways. They're, 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 they're the math is actually quite a bit simpler, um, that do end up scaling to much larger uh, data set sizes. Um, and they're the, really the only approach, uh, I mean, our, 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 our work, but also uh, the, the other, other work in this area, um, is actually the, really the only approach that scales to things like, like ImageNet scale data sets. So let me say, let me jump into um, what I mean by randomized smoothing here and how this actually helps. Uh, and, and, and I will sort of go through the proof, at least in intuitive, an intuitive manner, of how this helps uh, with robustness. So before I do, let me talk about what causes adversarial. Well, why do these things exist? Adversarial examples, um, again, in a cartoon way. Um, so they exist because, I mean, if, if we think that our classifiers work well kind of on average, or that they work well under, say, random noise, but they don't work well under adversarial noise, what that means is you have your classifier here, and you'll know, say this is the point you, you want to input, and this is the, the correct class, and this is some incorrect class. What, what it means, the, the existence of the adversarial example means that there is some maybe small, you know, me, small measure region of the wrong class kind of jutting into really close by our target point. And I mean, to be clear, it doesn't look like this, because what it really means is that every point has one of these, I mean, this is high, high dimensional, right? So every point in space you can really classify has these nearby points jutting into it. There's some other class, and you just, if you just want to search for that other, other point, um, you can find it without too much work. And so this sort of motivates a very natural defensive strategy to, to avoid this, which is to say, let's just smooth 
our, our predictions. I mean, this was what you were talking about before. This is all about Lipschitz constants, right? Judding things that jut in mean you have a high Lipschitz constant. It means you're really confident here and not very confident, and like really confident the other way here. That means your boundary is just, you know, your, 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 your decision functions are, are extremely uh, uh, crazy. <laughs> And so let's just smooth them to avoid this. So in particular, let's you know, convolve with a Gaussian. Let's, let's just add Gaussian noise to our input um, and pick the majority class uh, over, you know, over the, the draws of Gaussian noise. So to be uh, a little clear here, what I'm saying is this is our f in all cases will refer to the underlying classifier. I'll drop theta because I'm actually not going to worry about the parameters too much of our model anymore. Um, f is every case going to refer to our underlying base classifier. And G is going to refer to the classifier that just samples noise from a Gaussian and computes the, the majority class of the classifier under this Gaussian perturbation. Right, so it's a really simple procedure. I mean, to be clear, it's doing, it's, 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 I'm assuming for now both these things actually just output classes, not necessarily the decision function. They're just the class predictions, just to keep it simple. Um, so this is, you know, it outputs you know, negative one or positive one or, or zero or one, and then this predicts, you know, zero or one based upon which is the most likely class output by the, by the base classifier under Gaussian noise. And to be very clear, you know, this is not a, a new approach, um, not even a new approach in this context. This actually was already proposed as many times, I should say, as a heuristic defense, um, because it's very natural, right? If, if, if things are too, too spiky, you smooth them out a little bit. So it was proposed many times as a heuristic defense, but then it was also been proposed before and analyzed, I should be clear, very clear, as a, as a certified defense. So um, the real work uh, started here with, with some work by LaCour et al. and later some work by, by Lee et al. And they actually did demonstrate that this gives, this, this procedure can give certified results. Now what our work does is it simplifies the analysis and also, uh, in fact, so it proves a better bound. And in fact, we also show that bound is tight. And that actually, that is actually, you cannot do any better um, so it's an exact characterization of how well you can do under this Gaussian smoothing procedure if you make no more assumptions on your classifier. Uh, just to be clear, so this is a, yeah. uh, it, it will be by definition L2, L2. It's going to be an L2 bound, yes, which I'll, which I'll uh, come to in a few cents. But yes, we're going to talk only about the case. I'll mention at the end. It's very hard to extend it to other cases. We're going to talk about perturbations that lie within L2 ball of the original point. Yeah. Yeah, so what if you like use like the Bayes classifier yeah. instead of just thing? So, so um, I suspect you can get similar guarantees of, of you know, on, on, on log loss and stuff like this, but we're just, for this case of this, we're just going to analyze error, and so we're going to get guarantees on the error, yeah. And we haven't analyzed it too much yet, but I suspect it wouldn't be too hard to show. I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, if you don't look at just the maximum class, but actually look at the actual probabilities here, can you get a, a certified bound on log loss? The answer is, we haven't done it, but I'm pretty sure you can. OK, so just to sort of see what this looks like now uh, visually in a different way. Um, the basic idea, I mean, I, th I think everyone kind of gets it at this point. If you want to classify this thing, you don't bother classifying that. Instead, you sample a bunch of random perturbations of Gaussian noise applied to this thing. You classify all of these images here, and you take the majority vote over all of them. And that's our procedure for smoothing these things. Um, now, one thing that's important to note, which I may come back to later, but maybe not, um, is that this does require that our base classifier be able to classify noisy images, right? Because we're applying this classifier to this. There is no guarantee that a classifier you train on normal images will actually be able to do that task. So we end up training our classifier on these noisy images to try to classify them. And that seems to work. <laughs> Though other people, and I think Jerry is maybe one of them, <laughs> uh, team working, are working on other ways of training it that actually work even a little bit better. So there, there are other ways you can train. We're just going to train on these noisy images. Yeah. Training, you don't want each image to be good. You want the, the max over a set. That's a great point, and we don't do that. Uh, you, you can see what we're doing as sort of a simple, as sort of like, 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 the, like the simple, you know, one sample multicolor approximation to that, but uh, with like, you know, Jensen's inequality applied to like one to one exhibit. But, but uh, yeah, you're right. You want to train the actual smooth classifier, and we aren't doing that yet. Uh, though Jerry will get at that more, I think. Or he is doing something that's more like that. Yes? Do you have any insight into like uh, higher level architecture choices that would sort of automatically make you robust? Uh, so making architectures, I think it's a great question. Uh, can, 
What is better about architectures? It's not something really considering. I think for the most you know, for the most part, um, there has been some work in this. Like there's you know things like local activation functions seem to be better than these values, but but we don't really deal with that. We're we're really trying to use normal architectures like ResNets and see how well they work. Yeah. Did you retrain from scratch or did you transfer? Them? We retrained from scratch here. But you could transfer possibly to we just retrain from scratch. Yeah. Okay, so if you do this. Maybe move on, because I want to at least, at least say the theorem and the proof. If you do this, here is the guarantee you get. It's a really simple guarantee. So given some input x, I'm going to let y hat be the prediction of the smooth classifier. It's not, uh, not the underlying classifier, but the smooth classifier. And I'm going to let p, which has to be greater than 1 half, so this is going to be the binary case we're going to talk about, so just two classes. And I'm going to let p, which is, um, p is going to be the probability of that class under the distribution. So it has to be greater than 1 half, because otherwise we wouldn't have picked it. We would have picked the other class. Right. So, so again, y hat is the, is the prediction. And p is the probability that, the smooth class, that, that, that when you add the random noise, you know, what fraction of samples were classified that way. So again, under, you know, under our noise, what fraction of, of, of samples were actually classified um, as, as this y hat? Has to be more than 1 half. So here's our, given this, here's our guarantee. Then what we can guarantee is the prediction of the smooth classifier with a perturbation added will also be equal to the same thing. In other words, the, the, the classifier is robust to perturbations, delta, where the L2 norm of delta is less than this quantity. It's less than the variance, uh, sorry, the standard deviation of our, of our, sample, of our sampling distribution times the Gaussian inverse CDF applied to the probability that we estimate. And that's, that's the guarantee. Um, now, just to sort of get some intuition of what this looks like, what this means is if I add more noise, I can certify a bigger radius. But of course, the more noise I add, the harder the task gets to classify these things. So there's a trade-off there. And then the higher the probability is, this thing also increases. So if I, if I do this sampling, and get 99.9% you know, .9 of all my samples are, are in fact, the, 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 the same class as y hat. Um, I'll have a relatively high bound. If only about 50% are, I'll have a relatively low bound. And in fact, the Gaussian CDF looks like, the, the Gaussian CDF looks like this. So at, if, if I only get half, then I, I, I'm basically guessing anyway, so I can't do anything. So I, my radius is 0. Um, and as I get more and more confident, my radius grows to, to infinity. In fact, it will grow to infinity because the, uh, the Gaussian has, has full support. So the only way to get you know, true actual 100% probability is if everywhere you classify is positive, which is the trivial classifier, but that would give you an infinite radius. Um, but of course, you never get that right. And you can't actually also certify that with Monte Carlo sampling, which we'll get to uh, later. We won't worry about that for now. So again, this, this, so hopefully the bound makes sense. If it doesn't, let me, let me answer any questions about that now. This is the radius under which the prediction of our smooth classifier will not change. Do you have any constraints on the classifier f, or it can be any function? Anything, which is totally weird, right? Because before we did all this effort in analyzing the exact form of this, of this network, and actually, I think this is, this, this is the biggest gap, uh, which I'll get to at the very end uh, right now. Yeah? But you're, not, you're only reporting one point. So if you were to report a test error, a test robust, for instance, then it would depend on things like the architecture. Well, it depends on it implicitly because the architecture will, will affect what this probability is and how well you do on it. I mean. The better architectures get better performance, of course, right? So that's how it implies that. That's how it affects it. But there's no, I mean, there, there's no dependence here on the actual architecture in the form of the bound itself. That's Sorry, I mean. but I'm saying that's because this is a one-point bound. You're only, um, you're only certifying one point, whereas what we'd like to guarantee is over expectation, over the distribution. Right. So th this is not a generalization performance. This is just about actual smoothness of classifier. I'm not talking about generalization at all here. Um, that's hard enough in a different setting, right? Talking about generalization for deep learning. <laughs> um, I'm just talking about the smooth classifier in terms of its predictions, right? So you can verify a test set by just looking at the test set and knowing the true labels and seeing, or you can verify your prediction that it won't change, right? Um, but yes, th 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 this is not any sort of generalization guarantee. This is just saying that functionally, my smooth classifier will not change labels. But I mean, it is the right question. I mean, the question is this delta is a function of x, right? Um, it's a function of x only insofar as that what, what x is will affect the probability of correct classification, and that will affect the radius you can certify. Yeah, so you are certified for that uh, for the f at x. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it, it 
change the certification. Of course, yeah. I mean, because there is points on the boundary, <laughs> right? There, there actually is a decision boundary here. If you hit it, you, you can't certify anything. So yes, of course, the, the radius you're secure to, you, 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 are, you are certified for, will depend on the point you're exporting. Uh, yes. How's your definition of uh, certification different from the case of uh, bound propagation? Because it seems like a statistical statement. Um, the only difference really is that is, is actually this one is not any different. Um, the, the, the only difference comes in the fact that you can't compute this probability exactly, because this is the exact convolution of the Gaussian. So in practice, you have to have high probability guarantees instead of deterministic ones. But really, those are very high probabilities. So it's not that different. It's pretty similar. Okay, so let me, let me prove this, this fact now, and that will probably bring me to the end of my time. So I think to, to, before I prove it, I actually want to sort of um, frame it in terms of a very reasonable question, which is we got a lot when we started talking about this at, at first, which is, look, adversarial noise is worst case. It's measure zero. It was trained on the model. How on earth can performance on random noise, tell, which, which is not adversarial, tell you anything about performance in the worst case? This is a totally fair question, I think. So I want to go through sort of the intuition of the proof in, a, in, in, in hopefully a, a, an intuitive but informal manner. Because um, it's a really simple idea, actually. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to sort of set up this, this kind of game. And I'm going to suppose that I have two points, x and x plus delta. And I'm, because our classifiers are, are arbitrary here, the underlying classifier f is arbitrary. Um, we're going to let an adversary choose whatever f they want. So they, they can, the adversary can kind of craft the underlying decision boundary however they want to craft it to maximally kind of trick the smooth classifier. Right? So we're, again, we're coming up with the bound for the smooth classifier. So we're going to let the adversary kind of manipulate the underlying classifier as much as it wants to, such that two things have to happen. Basically, x has to be classified one way, and x plus delta has to be classified a different way. So if the adversary can, can construct some underlying measure such that that happens, then this classifier is not robust to this perturbation. The smooth classifier is not robust to this perturbation. So how would you go about doing this? How would you go about constructing some underlying prediction to fool the smooth classifier? So let me talk about how you might do that. Here are some, so a few, a few you know, points in space here. And here, I'm gonna, on this side, I'm going to draw the um, underlying classifier. And this side, I'm going to draw the smooth version of that. So one thing you might want to do if you're, if you're playing this game as an adversary is you might want to put you know, high, you know, this example here has the blue class. Uh, and this example here has the, has the, the, green, uh, the, 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 the orange class. This is a normal adversarial example for this classifier, f. But as we saw before, um, what happens when you smooth this now is that the smooth version, in the smooth version, you will kind of smooth out these bumps because the majority class in this region here is still the blue class, even though you know, this center point is, the, is the, uh, the orange one. What that means is essentially, and I'll, I'll hopefully, the, the, if, if, if this is sort of confusing, wait, wait, wait for the punchline. Hopefully, that part will make sense. Um, this, is, this doesn't work in the case of smooth classifiers. This, th th this is an adversarial example for the underlying base classifier. This does not translate to the smooth classifier. You could do the opposite too, right? You could also do something like this, where you know maybe you, you put most of your mass of, uh, on the orange class and very little mass on the blue class uh, around this example. But this has the same problem as before, right? The smooth classifier will again actually classify these two things as the same. So in all these cases, we're not getting different labels under this. Under, you know, after smoothing, we're getting the same label. For, uh, for, the, for the original point and its perturbation. So again, we need to think about what's the worst case kind of decision we could make to make this smooth classifier you know, make mistakes on both these points. Um, and it's not too hard to, to show um, that the worst case you can do as an adversary, you'll have to pick any classifier you want, is actually a linear boundary between the two. So the, worst, the best thing the adversary can do if it wants to sort of maximally fool the classifier uh, is to just put a linear decision boundary between the positive, you know, between one example and the other one. Um, and this follows actually from this follows from some basic facts and statistics. It follows from the you know the, the Neiman Pearson limit and hypothesis testing. Uh, is is Ludwig here? <laughs> he, he pointed out that actually this same exact fact was 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 uh, uh, from a paper from '98 um, for high dimensional Gaussians in that case. So essentially the exact same thing. Um, but the underlying fact is. The best an adversary can do to the worst case 
analysis we have to sort of analyze is the case of a linear separator between x and x plus delta. And the nice thing about that is that when you apply Gaussian smoothing to a linear separator, it stays linear. So all we have to do is analyze the linear case to figure out actually a worst case bound on what any underlying classifier can do. <coughs> and the nice thing about linear case, of course, is that you know, it's very simple to compute things like the distance from this point to uh, a, a hyperplane that separates the points. And in fact, this is exactly what we do. Uh, for, and well, this is a little bit informally stated, but essentially, we can compute the L2 distance between this and the decision boundary. And this sort of shows this, this is the actual radius, um, where P is the probability of, of, of this, of, of this uh, color, uh, the blue color here, uh, under this measure. Um, and when you do that, you basically imply that any perturbation with uh, L2 norm less than this radius here, which is exactly what we had before, can't change the class label. And that's the, that's the proof. That's, that, that, that's really all there is to it. Yeah? So if you tried to move away from Gaussian and you wanted to do something else, Great question. Maybe like some the isoparametric inequality for non-Gaussian. Um, so, so I don't know any. So, so, so we've thought a lot about non-Gaussian distributions me, uh, measures for um, like hopefully getting guarantees for other norms and cannot manage to get it to work. Um, and other pe uh, others, and, uh, including some, so, so Jeremy and, and uh, Ilan, as well as, as Jerry, have uh, hypothesizing that it's actually impossible to get anything other than L2 bounds with this exact approach without more assumptions uh, on, the, on the classifier. But maybe we'll talk about that offline, because that's, that's, that's it's a pretty involved story there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I, I'm almost out of time. OK, let me just then uh, show co a couple things. Um, first of all, caveats, which is the fine print. We're giving guarantees only for the smooth classifier, not the underlying classifier. So no, no problem with that. Everyone's OK with that. Um, I, 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 I list the, the easy caveat first. Big caveat. Um, we cannot compute the probability p. Right? This is the integral of a, of a, of a neural, for a neural network. This is the integral of, of uh, I mean, this, this, this is the convolution of a Gaussian with the prediction of a neural network. You can't do that tractably in high dimensions. Um, so in practice, we need to resort to Monte Carlo estimates to both form p, to both S, but not, not actually get it, to get a, really a lower bound on p, um, and to certify the prediction, to get the radius which we can certify it. And we have Monte Carlo, in paper, we have Monte Carlo procedure for both of those. Um, and they hold high probability. Now, and again, to be clear, this is high probability over the internal randomness. This is not like something the adversary could fool, unless the adversary you know, knows the random seed and things like this, right? So assuming, assuming cryptographic randomness, you, you, you can get these things balanced with high probability. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, um, just to highlight things, we are certifying this bound that I stated is tiny compared to the noise we're injecting. So the noise we inject is Gaussian random noise with, with uh, variance sigma squared, which scales like uh, sigma times d to the 1 half. Right? Um, whereas the radius we're, scaling, the radius we're certifying scales like uh, uh, just sigma, our variance. Our, 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 sorry, our standard deviation. So when you see those you know, these pictures here, like this, you know, know that we are not uh, we are not certifying adversarial noise like this. We are certifying that imperceptible adversarial noise still by classifying examples like this. So there still is this root d difference in how much noise you have to add versus the radius you can actually certify. Just just I want to make that clear because these pictures sometimes imply that we're really robust when we're not nearly that robust. All right. Let me just have the two results now, and then, I'll, and then I'll end. Result number one, this works better at certifying radi uh, you know, larger radii, essentially, than existing approaches based upon the dual relaxations. Uh, it doesn't quite don't, so if you use the same architecture uh, as these past approaches, so, so these, these ones here are three different runs of, of Eric's past work. Um, if you run our method with the same architecture, the smoothing method with the same architecture, you get this line here. So this is showing the certified accuracy you can attain uh, at what radius. So of course, as your radius gets bigger, you have less certified accuracy you can, ver you can verify. Um, it almost dominates all of these. But the really nice thing here is you, because it's a much more scalable approach, it just demands you know, random sampling, not some weird LP constructed on the actual network, you can scale to much bigger architectures and then actually dominate performance of past methods. And that's pretty consistent without too much tuning. The real benefit, of course, though, is that we can scale to things like ImageNet. So for ImageNet, we can also get guarantees of really, and, and this, this, this and to be clear, the approaches that you know, we're doing since concept before, is the only known defense, provable defense, that works at ImageNet scale. Um, 
And so, actually, I mean, I'll skip to this, this one here. You know, for example, for, uh, for we can certify a smooth classifier that has top 1% accuracy of 37% under any perturbation with uh, L2 norm less than 1, where here 1 is in normalized pixels. Um, so again, that's not a very big radius, a perturbation. Um, and that's this point sort of right here. Uh, but this is the first time, th 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 this is sort of much better than the existing provable bounds, which essentially are vacuous on ImageNet. Um, and just also to clarify, that, like, the reason why uh, as you add more noise here, your accuracy goes down. So you know, this is adding a little bit of noise. Then the naive accuracy is this, so, you know, even with no perturbation, uh, et cetera. Uh, with, when you add noise, you can certify a bigger radius, but your accuracy goes down. Because when you add noise, things like this class, which is a starfish, um, become completely washed out. And so there is a fundamental trade-off between noise and, and that. OK, so that's all. Uh, I think I've mainly asked, answered most of the questions in the, in the thing. Um, I alluded to some of these, these strange things. I think we're going to have to have bounds that depend on both the probability and the properties of the network to, to do much better than this. Um, and all the code we have and models experiments are available on our GitHub page. For questions, while the next speaker uh, sets in. Yeah. Uh, There's so one over there, I think. Yeah. You mentioned that um, shallower shallow and wider network uh, generally is more robust. Is that an uh, empirical conclusion or is it? Oh. So, so the statement that shallower and wider networks are more robust, that was only in terms of the other bounds I was talking about here. For, uh, for this smoothing approach, there is no correlation between the, the shallowness of the network and, and being better. In fact, all, really what was, all, all that really ends up happening is the better you are at classifying random noise, the better, you, or, sorry, images <laughs> with random noise, to be clear, um, the better you'll do. And so typically, the more power you have in your network, the better you are at that task, and so the better you do. So the statement about shallow networks does not apply to the randomized smoothing case, just to the other bounds. I think it's an artifact of the bound. In that sense, the Gaussian process is uh, like infinity-wide. That, will that perform the best? Mostly? Um, I, I, I don't think that you can really extend the analysis to, to like the, the limit case of Gaussian processes here, because it's a different activation. All these things are very different. Um, and I think the balance you would get would be vacuous in that case, no matter what, because you would always have some looseness, no matter what. So I, I don't see the connection with, 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 with sort of GPs and the infinite limit, um, though there might be something interesting there, too. I think it's better to just analyze GPs as GPs. I think we're going to try to chart. I think you can ask questions after break. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again. So we're moving on to the next uh, speaker. I think that's my brief. Talk about you personally. Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. I'm Matt but I think the important thing to acknowledge here are the people who actually did the work. So these are my uh, amazing students. Uh, and yeah, so I want to talk about adversarial perturbations, but somehow.